Welcome, everybody. Good morning. There's coffee outside yet. Did anybody see? Because it wasn't when, when we walked in, and that's kind of a bummer. No Is coffee, coffee yet. Still? Okay, I'm going to periodically stick my head out in between showing the time cards to see if there's coffee, and I'll let you guys know. Um, so welcome to Immersive Practices and Archaeological um, Practice and Publication. I am Jeff Emanuel. I am um, a CHS fellow in Aegean Archaeology and Prehistory and Associate Director of Academic Technology at Harvard. Um, and all I'm going to do from now on is introduce speakers and then get out of the way. Uh, so I'm really excited for what we have to, to see in this session. Um, I also have violently red, yellow, and green um, countdown cards. They gave me way too many here, all the way from five minutes down. So if you're presenting, I'm probably not going to show you anything other than a one and the stop, if that's okay. Um, but uh, either way, we'll just do what we need. We also have some flex time in the second half of this session should we run over or get a little bit of a late start like we have now. So please don't worry too much about time. We should be fine. I really want to get some question and answer, some conversation going. Um, so if we can do that, that's a lot more important, I think, than sticking to 20 minutes on the dot for everything. So without further ado, um, Rebecca Napolitano will be presenting first on visual visualizing the past, developing tools to facilitate accurate and immersive experiences in archaeology. Rebecca's a PhD candidate at Princeton in civil engineering. And now I'm going to do as promised and get out of the way. Great, thanks Jeff. Uh, yeah, as Jeff said, my name is Rebecca Napolitano. There's an edge of the stage, I'm going to try not to fall off without my coffee that I need. Um, I am in the Heritage Structures Lab at Princeton University, which means my home department is in Civil and Environmental Engineering. But all of the work that we do is highly collaborative with other disciplines. We work a lot, as you'll see in this presentation, with the Department of Art and Archaeology, uh, our biggest supporter is the Center for Digital Humanities at Princeton, and so that's why conferences like this are great, because it organically brings all those different kinds of people together. And so the title of my talk, uh, like Jeff said, is Visualizing Paths, Developing Tools to Facilitate Accurate and Immersive Experiences in Archaeology. And now this isn't working. Well, I'll just keep walking. So I think one of the more widely known Reconstruction of the past would have been Rome Reborn. My background, I came from Latin and physics, so I was more familiar with the Greco-Roman world. I'm sure there are many more uh, reconstructions that are done outside that are widely known, but this is the one that kind of got my attention at first, trying to do this reconstruction work. Uh, it was an international initiative to model the city of Rome at AD 320. This initiative took a wide range of expertise in order to facilitate the building of such a large model with so many different kinds of buildings. You had people who were experts in the primary sources. They could read the Latin and the Greek. You had experts in geographic information systems, computer science, Roman topography, 3D modeling, uh, Roman urban centers, uh, structural analysis, you name it, there was someone who was an expert working on that project, uh, all for the same common goal of doing a reconstruction of Rome. For me, that's, that seems a little daunting, because then it says, if I'm doing a digital reconstruction, does it mean I always have to have such a large group of people with such wide backgrounds? And what happens if I don't have someone from one of those disciplines, but I still want to do a digital reconstruction? Uh, does that make me unqualified or something along those lines? Is there a way, uh, one of my main research questions is, how can we facilitate the digital reconstruction of archaeological structures and broaden the base of those people able to participate. How can we try and take some of the knowledge that all of those experts have in their different disciplines and bring it together into concrete tools that people can use from uh, a variety of disciplines to do these digital reconstructions? And so in order to work on this very interdisciplinary task, I had to put together an interdisciplinary team, much, much smaller than the scale of Rome Reborn, because we don't have the same kind of budget. Um, but what you see on the top is our section from the Humanities. The students, uh, I have an undergrad and a graduate student in archaeology, as well as a really supportive faculty member who is the department head in archaeology. Uh, I worked with some students in computer science. Uh, that's Grace here on the bottom, your left. She's the first author on this presentation. She coded the actual database that I'm going to show you in a bit, and then my advisor. But in last year's section, when I th it came to some kind of discussion in this section about how you can facilitate these kinds of digital reconstructions within the academic sphere, uh, one of the points that I brought up is that my home institution has a center for digital humanities, and they're really the reason I was able to bring these kinds of groups together. 
I don't know if anyone else has ever struggled to get funding uh, for these kinds of projects. I'm always told in the civil engineering side, oh no, that's archaeology, go ask them for some money in archaeology. It's like, you're a civil engineer, what are you doing here with your hand up? Um, and so they were, they're my little home because they understand both sides. Uh, they were able to give us some kickstart and funding so we can build our interdisciplinary team. As well as we had help from a lot of different various students and both sides of the departments uh, in a course that I'm going to talk about in a bit. So as a group, we were trying to figure out if we were going to do a digital reconstruction, what were some areas that we see for tools, how, ways that we can improve this process and make it easier for people who maybe don't have a background in 3D modeling or maybe don't have um, a background in structural analysis. Uh, and so one of the areas we talked about was easier generation of forms. Uh, there are a lot of programs out there right now that do make it easy for parametrically generating or procedurally modeling structures, uh, such as City Engine, which is what is a large portion of what Rome Reborn used to populate their model, City Engine. Uh, but procedural modeling, you deal with issues of not being able to necessarily model isomorphic structures, structures that are very unique. Uh, you have to go into some other CAD program and develop your own models. And if you don't know how to do that, it can be a challenge. Uh, there's been a lot of work on the machine learning end of things where you can have 2D and 3D construction plans put together in order to create your 3D models. And so I think that could be a route of going about this for archaeologists might be more familiar with drawing 2D plans of their sites and drawing uh, section cuts and top-down views. And so if we can use this approach, that might be, might broaden the base of people who are able to participate in the reconstructions. Uh, the project I'm going to talk about today is this area of improvement. It's about trying to figure out what kind of materials were used for different reconstructions, uh, where they came from, and if they were necessarily good for construction or not. Some types of wood aren't good uh, for spanning long sections of buildings. Some types of wood are better than others. And so issues of that nature. And then lastly, something that was near and dear to my heart is automatic analysis of structural feasibility. Uh, what you're seeing here is an example from one of Lynn Lancaster's books. She, she is an archaeologist who is really, she's on the forefront of trying to make sure that people do check for structural feasibility when they're making digital reconstructions. And so what you're seeing here are two different reconstructions of building that aren't actually even feasible. There's a method called graphic statics, which is, is anyone here familiar with finite element modeling? You get a pretty rainbow structure and you're like, okay, that's cool, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not very intuitive to tell you if something's going to break or not. Um, graphic statics is a method where there's a thing, ooh, that's right here. There's a thing called a thrust line, and that's that dash line in the pictures. And if it goes outside the thrust line, it means your structure's not gonna stand. And so it's a much more intuitive form that you don't necessarily have to have a degree in civil engineering to read that drawing. You can say that both of these aren't going to stand if you just know what a thrust line means. And so trying to develop methods of automatically figuring out what that flow of forces is in someone's reconstruction, so that way they don't have to do a finite element model. No one should have to do that for all of these. I mean, I'm going to see here today, I'm assuming tons of projects which are very complex and it would take a whole other master's thesis or something else to do a finite element model of. That's, that's not feasible. Um, so trying to figure out ways to make that easier for people. But what I'm here to talk about is the database that we worked on because we thought this was one of the easier problems to start out with. And I'm a PhD student and I want to graduate, so I didn't tackle something that was going to take me forever. <clears throat> uh, in this pursuit of trying to figure out uh, tools that would be necessary for people doing digital reconstructions. I worked with my advisor to develop a course at Princeton, which was cross-listed between the departments of Art and Archaeology and Civil and Environmental Engineering, which was a very fun experiment. We actually had very good participation from both sides. It was, I think it was five civil engineers and six archaeologists, something like that. So it was a really good split down the middle, which we were happy about. Um, but for my research, it's nice when you get to design a course, you get to kind of point it toward what your research is to get your students to help you in that endeavor. Uh, I don't know if that's using my students, but it worked. Uh, and so what we did is we taught them, we taught the engineers about Roman construction techniques. And again, we focused on the Greco-Roman world just because that was what I knew something about and what my advisor knew something about. 
and we focus on teaching the archaeologists if you're looking at a building how do you know if a crack is going to make it fall down how do you know the cracks a crack's okay because sometimes cracks are okay uh, most historic buildings have cracks in them and then the final product which helps toward my research is that we wanted them to pick a structure that had either been completely destroyed over time or had partially collapsed and do a digital reconstruction of that. And so before we started this, we just asked our students, has anyone here ever done a digital reconstruction before? Just to kind of see what our background was for our students. Uh, surprisingly, there were students who actually had done a digital reconstruction before and we didn't know that. So that was, it's good to know at least where your students are coming from. Uh, but then we asked a series of questions trying to get at understanding what would be good to put in a database of information, like I was saying, about materials that they might want to know something about when they're doing a reconstruction. And so we asked them about if they knew where they can find Latin or Greek texts that discussed construction materials. And most people didn't necessarily know where to find it, but we put our baseline at. They would Google it because we figured that's what most people's first instincts would be. We didn't want the baseline just to be, I don't know, because we probably would have had some skewed just to one, uh, just to two, so that way, because you know, you can Google it, you kind of know things. Uh, the next question was just about uh, where, if you knew where you could find archaeological records, and most students didn't, because uh, we had a large group of engineers. Uh, material properties, we were pretty evenly split, because the engineers at least knew how to find material properties, but a lot of the archaeologists had never had to find material properties before. They were like, do you mean you can't just use any kind of wood, and that there's differences in uh, how each of those would respond to, being, to spanning really large sections? Uh, and so that was a good learning experience. And then, interestingly, I think this, I feel like I shouldn't say this, but it might be a failing of Princeton. We don't have GIS in our curriculum. And the civil engineers don't learn GIS. And the archaeologists, it's um, more toward art history. And so this was a little bit shocking that most of the students also wouldn't understand how to use a geographic information system. But it's, it's good to know that, I mean, there are people out there who didn't know all of these types of things, and so we wanted to try and bring all of that together. The next question was extremely leading. Uh, if there was a tool that would bring all this together and essentially make your final project much easier, would you uh, enjoy it? And every student said yes, because what student doesn't want their project to be a little bit easier at the end of the semester? And so from that, we were able to develop some user statements. Uh, as a user, I'd want to click on a map and access information about an XYZ. Uh, so it was materials, mechanical properties, primary sources, secondary sources, archaeological records. Uh, we also ended up putting some distribution maps in there. And this is, this is a prototype. It's a very, very alpha version. And I'm really hoping to get feedback from this audience at CIA at 8.15 in the morning. Hopefully, maybe some of you are awake enough to, because we want to make sure that this database is useful for a broad audience, and we only had 11 students to talk to. So I'm hoping that you guys can give more feedback. But this is the interface for a database, the alpha version. Uh, you can input a start and end date, so that way we were looking at stone and timber. Oh, you can't see where I'm circling here. We were looking at stone and timber in particular, and so maybe there's a quarry that opened up in a certain region at a certain time, and so you wouldn't have wanted to rebuild your structure with stone that wasn't actually accessible at the time that your structure would have been built. Uh, also, it's, it's just mapped so that way you can make sure that the materials that you're using for your reconstruction would have been able to be accessible to the people uh, doing the reconstruction. We have this scale bar here because with people's different economic situations, they can obviously access materials that are only really close by or really far, and so we have set that radius on the materials that people were able to access. And so here, oh, I forgot this doesn't work. Here's just a video, this is the splash screen <coughs> of us interacting with the alpha database. And so right now what you're able to do as a user is you can click, you can have stone and timber that you're trying to figure out what material properties and what kinds of trees and what kinds of stones were available in your area. We just have a small five meter radius. Uh, but then you can click on a particular tree or a particular stone and get the information that we were talking about in our user statements. So that way, if you know what the tensile strength of one of your materials is, you know that it can only span such a distance. And that, at that point, you might need columns in other places. So that way, your structural feasibility makes sense. And so some of our students 
For not having 3D modeled, I thought they did a pretty good job for just a semester's worth of work. And so these are just three of the projects that our students did and they were able to use the database. Here's a sunshade study that one did. Uh, but like I keep saying, this is definitely in its alpha version right now and we're looking for feedback on it. Some future work is that it's entirely locally based. You have to download the material on your computer and go through Unity, which is messy and clunky and not what we want our final version to end up being. So we're trying to move it over to a web-based interface. Maybe Mapbox, if any of you know of any better web-based interfaces for doing something like this. Um, but also we want to include other cultures and time periods. I know about the Greco-Roman world, but there are many other cultures and time periods that are doing digital reconstructions that we'd love to include in this database. So if you are an expert in one of those areas, I would love to talk to you afterwards about trying to figure out how to get data for those different periods. And so I don't have the conclusion slide because we are in the middle of this project and it is very much a work in progress, but the implications of our work, it's, it's our goal that by bringing these diverse data sets together required for digital reconstruction, we can lower the barrier of entry for those who can participate and ensure that models are feasible from an interdisciplinary standpoint without people having to be necessarily experts in all of those different disciplines I already listed. So, 1452 on time, that's okay. These are some people I would like to acknowledge. They work at the Center for Digital Humanities and they really, like I said, have helped me kickstart this project and bring together the interdisciplinary team I needed to do this. So thank you very much for your time this early in the morning and I'd be happy to take questions before I get coffee. <laughs>